Okay, so here we're going to talk about how to make things great. So, what's the difference? I'm going to ask for a little audience participation here. What's the difference between something that's good and bad, a good product or a bad product? What's the difference between a terrible experience and an amazing experience? What? Okay, great. The smell. The smell. Who said that? I'm actually going to talk about that. That's great. Uh, who else? <laughs> the voice. You've been listening. I like it. Any other thoughts? Consistency. Consistency. I like it. That's that's really good. Clarity. What's that? Clarity. That's a great one. I like it. Okay. So how do we go about deciding whether or not we're going to build a good product or a bad product? Or if we're going to design a great service or a terrible service? Has anybody here ever participated in building a terrible product? That's good. There's a lot of honest people in the room. I appreciate that. When you did that, did you sit down and say, let's build something nobody will like? <laughs> right? You remember those old uh, financial service firms? They had the commercials with like the little kids going, I want to get forced into early retirement. <laughs> did, did anybody do that? No? Okay. Has anybody here built a product or service they're really, really proud of? Great. So in that situation, did you sit down and say, I'm going to build a great product. I'm going to build a great service. I assume you did. And then therefore it happened, right? Pretty straightforward. I'm going to talk for a little bit about an experience that most Nebraskans should be fairly familiar with. I apologize if you're a vegetarian. I do not mean to offend anybody. I just want to find lots of common ground with a lot of people. And that is, let's talk about what it's like to go out and have a steak dinner with your spouse. And let's talk about what makes that experience enjoyable and unenjoyable. And, and, and just talk through a few things that go into it. So the first thing you want to know is, where's the restaurant? When is the restaurant open? How do I get to the restaurant? Can I look at the menu ahead of time of the restaurant? Some people want to know what's there. You know, is there anything I'd like? So you decide you want to go to the restaurant. You want to get reservations. How easy was it to get reservations? Were you able to do that online? Did you have to call? If you called, did you get a person immediately or did you get a machine? <coughs> if it was answered by a person, was it noisy in the background? Did you have trouble hearing them? Did they sound like they didn't want to talk to you? Or were they dedicated to, to taking your call and making sure you had your reservation set up? When you go there, is it easy to park? Is the parking lot well organized? Is it easy to get a space where you're not you know, having to walk a long way or wait a long time or things like that? You go in. When you open the door, do you open the door or does somebody else open the door? Do they open the door for you and invite you in or do you have to bring yourself in? Once you're inside, what's it like? Who said smell? Who said smell? What does it smell like inside of a restaurant? How, how is that experience? What's the temperature? Is it comfortable? Do they greet you when you come in? Or is there just a, a morass of people and you have to fight your way up to a, a counter or somebody to find you a table? What's the temperature like? How long does it take to get seated? How about your lighting? Can you see the people around you? Do you want to see the people around you? Or do you just want to see your spouse? When I go out with my spouse, I only want to see my spouse. I don't care about the other guy and his spouse or whatever they're doing. So is it, how is that? How's the sound? Is it really noisy? Can you not even hear your spouse on the other side of the table? Or is it so quiet you're afraid to talk to your spouse because everybody within three tables is going to hear your conversation? Is the table clean? So you sit down at a table. Is the table solid? Is the table sturdy? Does it wobble? Is it clean? What's it made out of? Is it a smooth material? Is it a coarse material? What, what, what factors into that? Um, your seats. What kind of seats are you in? Are the seats solid? Are they, do they feel sturdy? Do they, do they scare you when you sit in them because they might not be able to handle it? Uh, when, you, when you scoot into your table, you're going to reach down probably and, and grab the sides of that chair and touch the bottom of the chair. Is the bottom of the chair clean, right? Or is that going to be a, a surprise when you reach down there? <laughs> are they comfortable? Do they have arms? So then you meet your server, your waiter, or your waitress. Let's talk about them. Are they polite? Do they say hello? Do they give you their name? 
Are they dressed appropriately for the evening? Do you, are you okay with it? Does it distract from you? Are their clothes clean? Are their hands clean? This person's gonna be carrying your food. Do they have clean hands? If their hands are clean, do they have maybe like dirt under their fingernails or anything like that? Is there anything off about them? Uh, do they have piercings that you might not like? I'm cool with anything, just to be clear, but what, what's that like? Um, do they know about the menu? Can they tell you about all the dishes that are available? Have they tried the food? Can they recommend a wine? I'm a guy that likes to look sophisticated drinking wine, but I know nothing about wine. So I always count on a good waiter to recommend wine for me. So can they do that based on the meal I want? Can they recommend a dish? One of my favorite things to do is to go into a restaurant and say, I'm from out of town. I've never been here before. I'll never be here again. I want you to pick the best thing on the menu for me, pair it with a good wine, and let's see what happens. I recommend you all try that at least once, by the way. It's really exciting. I do it a bunch. I've only ever been burned once, had this weird thing with anchovies in it. The rest of the time, it was great. So are they prepared? OK, so this, this is an actual steak that I ate at a restaurant in town called Mahogany. And um, phenomenal place, and <coughs> phenomenal dinner. And I, I'm also a little self-conscious about this picture right now because I recently found a Tumblr blog called Pictures of Hipsters Taking Pictures of Their Food. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm trying to decide if I'm, if I'm slipping out of denial or into something else. But anyway, so we went there for a company party once and we had this phenomenal waitress. She was just on top of it. We were in a fairly dim room dedicated just to us. There were candles on the table. One of the candles went out. She grabbed it, she had a lighter in her pocket, lit it up, good, wow, she was on it. We all got our food at the exact same time. They actually brought in like half a dozen people to set all of the plates down at once, which I love because I am inevitably the guy who gets his food last and has to watch everybody else eat. So this is a steak place, right? So everybody's ordered steaks prepared the way they want. And they say, would you all please cut your steak a little bit and make sure it's cooked to your satisfaction? And out of nowhere, every single person had two LED flashlights in their hand, and everybody had a personal spotlight over their steak <laughs> so they could verify that it was cooked correctly. That is amazing preparation and attention to detail. Another waiter waitress story, uh, you know, how do they interact with you? How, how do you get along with them? I believe a good steak is hard to find, meaning it's rare. Went to a, a steak place in Kansas City. <laughs> I told my daughter there's no such thing as a bad pun. Um, what'd you say? No, she's really yeah. So we go to a, a steak place in Kansas City, and I order my steak rare. And my wife makes a comment. He always orders it rare. And the waiter says, it's OK. I used to bartend in New Orleans. I don't judge. <laughs> I don't know what that means, but it didn't upset him. Contrast that with the night I ordered this steak. I told the waitress, I'd like it rare. And she says, you know what? I used to be a vegetarian, but now I eat all my steak rare. I love it. Her and I bonded at a certain level. I'm like, we should hang out. Maybe go kill something together. <laughs> so, we, so we get the menu. Is the menu laid out plainly and clearly? Are there descriptions of the foods that you can understand? If there are pictures, are there pictures of the things you want to eat? Nothing bothers me more than seeing like, four or five pictures down the side of a menu, but the one thing I think I might want, there's no picture, and I don't understand what that oddly named pasta is. So I, I want to be able to see that. If you have a special diet, is it clear from the menu what is appropriate for you to have or, or, or what not? Or if you have allergies, can you tell what's safe for you to eat and what's not? The napkin, is it a cloth napkin? Is it, is it a high quality napkin? The silverware, nothing can ruin a meal like silverware in my opinion. You don't want to pay $50 for a steak. By the way, I had a gift certificate, so don't get any ideas. You don't want to pay $50 for a steak and hold a cheap fork or a cheap knife in your hand. You want to cut through that thing with a machete, and you want to have a solid, firm fork in your hand. It needs to be clean. It needs to be spotless. If, if one of those prongs is even off just a little bit, nobody will notice until you, you put it in your mouth and you pull it out and it kind of scrapes your lip a little bit. That's terrible. <laughs> okay. Let's say you need to go to the restroom. Were the restrooms clean? Again, with smell. How did the restroom smell? Was it acceptable? When you were in there, did it have everything you needed while you were in there? I'll let you decide what that would be on your own. 
So then we're talking about just the steak, right? So, so this is a cut from an animal. We need to know how is that animal raised? What lineage, I, I guess, <laughs> that animal came from, right? Who its parents were matter. Uh, how was it fed? Was it given any growth hormones? We have a customer we recently acquired who grows his beef cows over three years. The average is one year. He range feeds his cows, sells his most expensive cut of meat for $40 a pound. That's a significant difference in the quality of your meat. How was it cut? The same guy told me he supervises the, the chopping up of the meat every time. He, he watches it and he makes sure, he says, I spent three years raising these things, I'm gonna make sure they get processed correctly. This one was an amazing, there's, this, this is a shoulder cut. There's only two of these on every cow. And it was, it was amazing. Um, what rubs or marinades were applied to it? Mahogany uses only butter, salt, and pepper. And I'm, I don't know for sure, but I bet they're very particular about what kind of butter, what kind of salt, and what kind of pepper. So you eat your steak, you're going along, you have a drink, does your drink stay full? Do you run out of water? Do you get thirsty? Do you get a dry mouth? Is the server taking care of you? Or if you have sides with it, are those prepared correctly? Do they come by and say, would you like some dessert? Are you interested in a dessert menu? When they do that, do they have the dessert menu with them or do they have to like go off and come back? One interesting thing about the dessert menu at Mahogany is it's half dessert food, half dessert liquor. Um, okay. And you say, could I have my check please? How long does it take? When you get the check, is everything correct? Do they greet you on your way out? When you leave, do you have to open your own door or do they open it for you? And is leaving the parking lot easy? Now it may seem like I really beat this to death and that's because I did. Because a thousand small things add up to one great experience. All of those little tiny decisions, all of those little factors add up to making it either a great dining experience or a terrible dining experience. And actually, I'm not in the food industry. I have a feeling if I were in the restaurant business, I would view these as the big things, right? But all of these little things go into what makes it great. So when somebody is using your software, navigating your website, talking to your customer support, all of these little things matter. The other thing that's interesting about it is, if you get 999 things right and one thing wrong, you don't get a score of 999. Depending on what the thing is that went wrong, you could go straight from 1,000 to zero with one mistake. So let's talk about going out to dinner. Let's say, heaven forbid, you find something you really don't want to find in your salad in your salad. It's one mistake. Everything else is perfect. You're never going there again. And you're telling anybody that'll listen that you're never going there again and they won't go there either. So you have to really, really be careful about that. John Wooden is a college basketball coach. I actually am not very passionate about sports. I'm super passionate about excellence though. And this was the most accomplished college basketball coach in the history of American college basketball. Super, super detailed guy. He would get together with his college, his basketball players on the first day of their freshman year, say, gentlemen, the number one problem that stops people from being able to play is blisters on their feet. If you put your socks on correctly, you won't have this problem. So I'm going to teach you how to put on socks. <laughs> These are college students. So maybe, anyway. Um, just all the little details matter. So how do you accomplish this level of attention to detail in your business. One way, and that's why I asked my friend to come, is let's just be like Steve. Steve Jobs was amazing. Steve Jobs was incredible, had incredible attention to detail. Look at your iPhone. Look at all the detailed decisions that go into that iPhone. People make fun of Apple people because they obsess over every detail. We obsess over every detail because we know every detail was obsessed over, right? And everything was done for a reason. So here's the problem. Steve Jobs was an incredible micromanager, incredible detail, incredibly detail-oriented, and none of us can be like him. So most of us are not as smart as Steve Jobs was. Most of us don't have the breadth of experience Steve Jobs had with all the different things he did in his life. 
We don't have the attention to detail. We don't have the energy to pull it off. And even if we had all of those things, none of us has all of those and the charisma to not have people walk out on you when you treat them the way he treated people. He was amazing. He had incredible skills like that. So how do the rest of us do this? First, we hire knowledgeable people you trust and you give them the vision of what you want accomplished. So when I started Agape Red, I was like, okay, we need a nice logo and all that stuff. And hopefully my first attempts at that are unrecoverable and will never be seen. <laughs> so I, I hired a professional designer, sat down with him and said, okay, here's my company. Here's what we're about. Here's what I care about. Here's what I want to do. And he said, great, that's all good information. And then he started asking me questions that I didn't understand. He would say, well, do you like this kind of style or that kind of style? And I just kind of, huh? What did you just say? But he was prepared. He had a book of logos and he said, well, do you like that one or that one? Oh, okay, I can make that decision. So I said, oh, I like that one. We went through that three or four times and he understood what we liked and, and, and what we wanted and he put something together and I loved it. Now there were a million little details in that that I won't notice, I'll never notice, but will have a positive effect on people interacting with our brand and our business. We hired a sales and marketing person. I don't know anything about sales or marketing. I trust her. Fortunately for me, she's a very, very, very patient woman and is willing to take the time for me to learn, to get caught up with her level of experience. When we leased an office, I hired an interior designer. I knew we had to do that. We had no choice. We would be hopeless on our own. And she was great. She came in, she looked at what we were doing, she gave us some floor plans, talked about it, you know, said like, hey, here's an option where you can have a private office. I said, no, that's not us. And then she understood. Communicated the vision and the values to her and she understood from that. She also taught me a lot, right? She taught me red's an extremely powerful color. So you can't mix it with other extremely powerful colors. Otherwise it's jarring and it confuses people and upsets them. You also can't have too much of it by itself because it's overwhelming. So the majority of our office is white or off-white with red accents. It's, it's beautiful, she did a great job. Second, learn as much from those people as you possibly can. So ask lots and lots and lots of questions. And this isn't micromanaging, and this isn't dictating small changes to them. This is asking them, why did you do this? So here's an example. You're talking to a graphic designer. Do I have five minutes? Okay, cool. You're talking to a graphic designer, and you notice that they arrange things in certain order, or they emphasize something, and you say, why did you emphasize that? And they say, because that's the most important thing among the things on the page. And you say, well, actually, in my mind, that's less important than this other thing. And you're not having a conversation about design details. You're having a conversation about values and what's important. You're communicating the vision to them so that they can figure out the details that need to be implemented. Next, take deep dives. Jack Welch, CEO of General Electric, 300,000 employees, billions of dollars in revenue, was famous for this. He was a great, phenomenal manager, had great people working for him. But he would, if he felt like he needed to, pick an area that was either a problem or something that he was really interested in and just dive all the way in on it and learn every single detail. Again, that's not micromanaging. That's identifying an area of your business that needs your attention and learning more about it. Don't be afraid to try things. You need to get all the details right, but you're never, ever, ever going to get them right the first time. So what you want to do is you want to get out there, you want to start executing, and then you want to do this last thing, shorten your feedback cycles, make them as small as possible. If you can make a change to your process or your product and get feedback from your customers the same day, that's amazing. Right? I always think about these poor guys that have to design highways. Can you imagine? They get 20 years to find out if they had a good design or not. Wow. Okay, real quick, let's talk about you. So what's the difference between the person you thought you would be today and the person you are today? What's the difference between the person you are today and the person you want to be 10 years from now? It's not one big thing. It's a ton of little things, little decisions you make every single day. So for me, I'm a naturally aggressive person and want to accomplish lots of things. So think about the books you read. Think about the things you listen to. I have like 20 podcasts I subscribe to. 
Think about who you follow. Are you following people because they're funny or are you following people because you can learn from them and they can make you better? Uh, reader, keep up with the news all the time. I don't watch the local news or read the local newspaper, but I keep up with the news that I care about. I meet up, go to meetups, meet with people that are interesting, smart, intelligent thought leaders in the community. And, and that's actually an exercise app that I've never launched. Um, <laughs> it doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. The other thing to remember is you can't just add stuff to it. You have to take away. And my big vice is television. Okay, these are all TV shows that I have seen or am in, am in the process of seeing every single episode. I added it up last night. It's like 780 hours of television or 20 full time working weeks. This is my vice. I, I, I have a goal to unplug from Netflix at the end of the year, but don't hold me to it. <laughs> and, and I'm working through burn notice right now. And I just want to say, what you take into your head influences you. This is what happened last time I went grocery <laughs> shopping with my wife. So if you watch Burn Notice, you'll appreciate that. Blueberry. I like blueberries. So in conclusion, I want to end this on a high note. You guys can take control of your, bus of your businesses, your lives, your future, by just focusing on one small detail at a time, one little thing a day, every day, get a little bit better, a little bit better. You make it a thousand miles by marching 10 hours a day, every day, not by trying to sprint at the end. That's it, thanks.